Okay, great. Um, all right. So, um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Divya, uh, a member of Ocean Now, uh, and I'm extremely happy and excited to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, so, I will be co hosting this event along with Micah and Zora, uh, also from Ocean Now. Uh, and before we proceed, I would just like to uh, draw your attention to a few points. Um, the interview will be around 30 to 45 minutes long, uh, followed by a Q&A session for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, this session will be in English. Uh, your mics are muted by default, and if they are not, uh, please do mute your mics now. Uh, we will unmute your mics if it's required in the Q&A session. Uh, regarding Q&A, if you have any questions for our panelists during the event, please submit them through the chat directly to Sora. Um, how this works is in the chat window, you can see a drop down menu with the entire list of participants and you can select Saurabh's name before you hit send. Uh, during the Q&A, we will ask a question on your behalf. Okay, uh, so with that, we can now begin. Um, let me start again by thanking everyone for joining us today. Uh, this event is part of our virtual event program in Seprupal on our relationship with the ocean and nature. Uh, our topic for discussion today is the unprecedented cri crisis that we're all in, uh, which is not only threatening our lives, but also our livelihoods. Uh, I'm sure we all have questions about how we got here, which of our actions are making diseases like COVID-19 possible. And uh, researchers believe that humanity's de destruction of biodiversity and the environment is largely responsible. Uh, we need to rethink how our economic system works and if it is possible for a healthier economy to coexist with a healthy environment. Um, what are the solutions and what actions do we need to take to build this uh, sustainable future economy? These are broadly some of the questions and points we're going to be discussing today. Uh, we are joined today by Kate Jones and Christian Felber. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to be with us today. Uh, and uh, with that, okay, so just a quick introduction. Uh, Professor Kate Jones is a biodiversity scientist. She is the chair of ecology and biodiversity at the University College London. Uh, she's known for her innovative, broad, cross-disciplinary research in the linkages between global change, biodiversity, and ecosystem services. Kate hosts scientific advisory positions for a number of national and international conservation charities and was the chair of the Bat Conservation Trust. Kate is joining us today from London. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also joined by award-winning author Christian Felber. He is a university lecturer and co-founder of the foundation, The Economy for the Common Good. He has written several bestsellers like The Common Good Economy, Ethical World Trade, and more recently, This is Not Economy. He co-founded the International Association for Promoting the Economy for Common Good in 2010 uh, with a vision to build a better world where the economy is aligned with the ethical values that enables a good life for everyone, uh, for people, animals and nature. His foundation has been working on a lot of systemic improvements by working with governments and other organizations like the European Union and uh, the UN. Uh, Christian is also, uh, sorry, Christian is with us today from Vienna. Uh, if you wish to learn more and support the movement uh, economy for the common good, we will be sharing details in the chat uh, later during the event. Uh, thank you so much again uh, for taking time out and joining us and uh, let's not waste any more time and uh, we can start. Um, so the first question is for Kate. Um, let's begin the discussion by trying to understand a little bit more about zoonotic diseases. Uh, could you share your findings on how COVID-19 originated and what subsequently, how it subsequently transmitted to humans? Uh, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to come and talk. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of separate our suspicion to the facts. So the facts about COVID-19 are, uh, you know, a bit thin on the ground. So the suspicions are that COVID-19 came from an animal source in Wuhan in China. So um, the facts are that the coronavirus 
is very, very similar, 96% sim similar to a coronavirus, which is, has already been found and discovered in uh, a bat species that's present in China, which is called Rhinolophus affinis, which is this really, very, very cute horseshoe bat with a very weird nose. So that's the facts, right? So what we suspect is that that was the, uh, that, you know, something happened to that virus. It was transmitted, could be via another species, but it ended up, or a very similar one ended up in, in humans. So it mutated and got into the human population. So I just want to say that zoonotic transfer, and this is the, the transfer of, pathogens which could be fungal could be viral could be you know any kind of pathogen could can be transmitted between animals and people so all animals on the planet have their own pathogens as we do so it's not really about any particular animal that's to, to blame it's more about how the pathways between animals and humans are changing so it's incredibly difficult for a pathogen to get from another species into into humans because we have a fantastic immune system and it's in, even more difficult for a human to spread a zoonotic pathogen to another human because you think about all the barriers that has to have that that are in place mm. for an animal to actually get a human disease a, um, a pathogen mm. to move from animals to humans and then you've got to infect the human so much that it then sheds the, sheds the pathogen into the environment and then he, a, another human will get it. So it's an incredibly rare event, incredibly difficult to do. But what's happening is that there are so many more of us, we're so well connected, we're increasing these pathways of transmission uh, million, million, bit, there's billions of us, so we're, we're kind of increasing this transmission pathway between animals and humans, and that's why we're getting uh, these spillover events. And we don't exactly know what the spillover event was that caused the coronavirus to emerge in humans, but it's something about our interaction with with animals um, in those kind of in, in settings where we're exposing ourselves to their pathogens. Okay. And um, do you see a future where we're likely to see a rise in more animal-borne infectious diseases like this? And, what, and if that is the case, then what do you think are the key drivers that are causing this rise? Um, I think it's important to think about um, these zoonotic diseases in two ways. Firstly, is this kind of novel spillover that happens, like a new one that we've not seen before spills over into the human population and then there are the and then it might go human to human and then there are these ones which just happen all the time and they're endemic to lots of regions across the world so for example Lassa fever is found in West Africa and Lassa fever is like is a, is a hemorrhagic fever like Ebola and it causes more cases uh, of, of people that are sick and dying than Ebola ever has and this is a seasonal thing that happens every single year. And Nigeria in 2018 had a massive spike and they're having another one in 2020. So, you know, these are things that happen that can be new and novel, or it can be just this endemic disease that happens. Um, so we really have to think about it in different ways, like for a pathway for a novel disease to spill over, that's more about how we're interacting in different ways with, with, um, with different species. So that could be like hunting and bringing species into trade and travel and um, you know, pet trade and for medicine. But for, for things like Lassa fever, which is endemic, it's, it's from a, a rat and it's an agricultural pest. And it's just contact with feces and urine in contaminated food that causes the spillover. So um, it's, it's a very complicated process and I think it's useful to think about this novel versus endemic, but the pathways are slightly different in those two cases, but you know, it's about how we're interacting and changing those pathways and changing transmission dynamics between animals and people. So do I think they're increasing? 
yes because there's more of us so it's really difficult to measure because um you know the more you look for a disease the more you find it so you know some areas which aren't kind of very well studied you wouldn't know if it was an ebola outbreak <laughs> just, it would just go under the radar so it's difficult to know if they are increasing numerically empirically but the drivers which make that more that kind of pathway change more likely are increasing so there's more of us so since the great acceleration in the 1920s there's now like seven and a half billion of us there probably will be 11 billion of us by the end mm. of the century we fragmented all kinds of different habitats across the world which are now you know and we're having a, a massive decline in in the number of wildlife populations have gone down by 60 percent so like the drivers which cause these spillovers to happen like intensification of agriculture all of that is increasing and also our connectedness around the world so that's important because uh you know a novel spillover may you know if it'd been in the middle of drc for example may not have gone global but mm. because it was in china and we've completely connected to china it's spread across the world so you know we're intimately connected to each other than we never were before in in mm. the extent that we never were before so all of the drivers that I think change the transmission dynamics are increasing. So I would say having no data on this, but that's my hunch that it is increasing. Okay. And like more specifically, if you could spend some time explaining what actions that we uh, in our interactions with biodiversity in general, which of our actions specifically are affecting the situation in a more significant way. Like you mentioned hunting, you uh, mentioned uh, intensifying agriculture, and of course, the fact that we're all very interconnected. So what would you say is, um, are, what other actions uh, that uh, are causing this? Like, are there any others? I think land use change in particular is the biggest, is the mm. biggest driver of this. And I think, you know, it, it's a very, you asked me a very different question. <laughs> And I, I don't know, I can't tell you empirically which I think is the biggest driver because you know, okay. nobody's done that study. But you know, the, the drivers are you know, how we change the landscape and how we're interacting with that landscape. And it's complicated, I'm not afraid of saying that, but it is complicated because species respond in different ways to increasing human pressure and increasing land use. So some species which harbour pathogens which could hurt us, like they're, they're called zoonotic hosts, like hosts that host the pathogens, mm. they, they respond very negatively to human disturbance. So they go completely out of the way because they can't stand us and they go somewhere else or go extinct locally. So we don't have to worry about those ones. Okay. Well, we have to worry about them in other ways, but you know, we don't have to worry about the risk for those. But for other things like rats, rodents, for example, you know, we convert the landscape in, in a way which favours their populations. And then it means that our, our risk from spillover because of that pathway, you know, the, the chance of getting something from that pathway is now increased, increased. Mm. So it kind of depends on how the host responds to anthropogenic change. But we, we, we're finding that in general, the more that you intensify the use of a landscape, the more you're changing those transmission dynamics for in a negative way. So we're getting more spillovers in that way. I mean, you know, you know there's been a lot of talk about wet markets and uh, these farmers markets in, in China and, and, and how, are, you know, how important are they for spillover? And I would say that you know, wet markets fulfill a hugely important role in those economies. And, you know, it's the live animal markets not, uh, that, are, that are sometimes part of a wet market that are, you know, definitely increase the spillover risk. But, you know, the incidental spillovers from, you know, intensive farming or, or interactions of, of people and animals across a massive landscape of the planet, you know, perhaps possibly that's more important than a point source in, you know, one wet market in China example so I, d I don't know but because uh, we haven't done those studies but you know empirically you would think that or theoretically conceptually you would think that um you know because of the of the huge amounts of interfaces that we've created 
that wet markets aren't going to be contributing a huge amount to the total numbers of spillovers that happen. Hmm. Okay. And, um, and to take a little bit of uh, a change in what we're discussing, <laughs> like what do you think is the relationship between zoonotic diseases and climate change? How do you think uh, mm. climate change makes us more vulnerable to such outbreaks? Um, I think climate change can act on lots and lots of different parts of that pathway. So, you know, it could, it could operate on uh, making the animals, you know, uh, ranges shrink, for example, or it, the animals range more suitable so that there's more of them. So that's that part of it. So that's the animal kind of hazard part of it. But then you've got the kind of epidemiological part of it in humans. So climate change may, you know, depending on which country you're talking about, which region, it might make access to healthcare provision uh, worse, for example, or it might make the state more vulnerable to governance issues, for example. And so that that part of it might be, might be difficult you know, more difficult to cope with an epidemic once it's, it's broken out. And then, you know, the cl climate change may act at a, at a higher level in terms of, you know, breakdown of international cooperation, or, you know, that we are now, we can't control the borders in a cohesive way because we're all shouting at each other or, or something. So, you know, it could act on lots and lots of different areas and it, it could act on on the seasonality of the hosts as well. So they may become, you know, more prevalent during sun seasons and that may make them more abundant. So I guess it's kind of, you know, it's not one effect and the, the effect of, of climate change on those diseases are gonna be particular to that disease. So, so for example, if you were talking about vectors, mm. then those are insects and mosquitoes and things like that, that are transferring say malaria to, from people to people, then, you know, climate change may make their biting rates higher, their reproduction faster, you know, so that actually may directly influence the malaria or the areas suitable for those, those insects. So it really is a very complex situation that you need to think carefully about. So it's not like climate change will do this, deforestation will do this. It's like a very, it's a complex systems dynamic, which yeah. Yeah, we need to embrace, really <laughs> understand how to yeah. make predictions and and that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to predict the next you know spillover and pandemic because of these factors and that often the public health community and the international community think of one issue at one time yeah. so they'll think about malaria tb and hiv like you know that's what they'll think about they won't think or think about treating the patient rather than the proximate causes of the patient's condition, rather than the ultimate one, you know, which may be the destruction of nature in this case. So it's a complex system and difficult to treat. And we don't have the international uh, frameworks to treat it. And, and also, I'm an ecologist, <laughs> not a public health person. And what I do is quite niche. And now it's quite mainstream. So I don't, I don't have a home in terms of the discipline that I'm in. Mm. And that's another problem that this is a really important area that, you know, in order to understand it, we need to embrace the ecology into public health. And that's not really been done to any mm. kind of great degree. <clears throat> mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was so me it's, thing, by the way. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> So it seems like there, um, like once we have these situations escalate, there are negative feedback loops which are likely to aggravate things further, and there are likely to be newer situations that might come up, like when we are fighting one crisis, uh, because of the sort of uh, snowball effect of all of these crises happening at the same time. Uh, that's what you're saying. Like they're they're all interconnected in more ways than one, and uh, okay, so I understand. You what know, you're on the positive side, though, there are win-wins, right? So there's a win-win here. You leave a forest intact. You, yeah. you know, reduce the chances of spillover. You store carbon. You don't get runoff of water. It doesn't flood the valley down below. 
you know, you're, you're producing wood in a sustainable way for community. You know, like there's win-wins here, not just win, not just lose-losers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so it's just about having a more long-term, and I'm, I'm sure Christian is more qualified to talk about this than I am, but like um, having a more long-term view of what the worth is, what the value is of intact systems and ecosystems and what services they're providing to us, not just to make a quick buck and to put an oil palm plantation in and feed the community, but for the long term, you know, so, so if you do that, then you'll destroy wildlife. Okay. But you'll, you'll, you'll reduce the ecosystem services like flood prevention, water purification, air quality reduction, climate temperatures going up, carbon emissions. So a uh, risk, a risk of fires, you know, there's lots and lots of things that happen, but that's not considered when someone's doing a planning application to take down a forest. So why doesn't that happen? And why can't we have a long-term financial model which looks at the actual true costs of doing this, not just the quick buck that you can make in 10 years and then the soil's mm. completely ruined? Yeah, Sorry, that was me ranting again. I no, need to, I'm going to stop <laughs> stop. <laughs> No, <laughs> you have to talk. Uh, okay, so this is a good uh, uh, point in our conversation to bring Christian in. Uh, and you did uh, give a brilliant lead up to our next question. Uh, so we're going to be discussing um, the, the more prominent calls coming in to move towards alternative systems and economic models uh, for a more sustainable future. And uh, one such approach is the common good economic model. And Christian is uh, an expert on this. Um, Christian, would you like to tell us uh, a little bit more about this? Like, could you elaborate what this model is about? Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, thanks for inviting me. And I will follow up directly where Kate um, stopped. <laughs> um, I would. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, build some bridges between what you have just said and um, an economy for the common good. Um, I would start with uh, distinguishing between economists uh, that focus on wealth and economists that focus on well-being or the common good. Um, and actually, if you look at the, um, the Greek, the ancient Greek origin of the term economy or economia, uh, those economists that focus on wealth, um, and I mean material or financial uh, wealth, are not economists by definition, but uh, the opposite of economists. They are crematists, which uh, means literally to focus on material or financial monetary wealth uh, rather than on the well-being of the household members, uh, which uh, comes from the first part of the word uh, economy is oikos, it's the household. The same term is also in ecology, but ecology <laughs> is a natural science different from economy, which is a social science. And uh, the ecology tries to understand the laws of nature. Uh, it's a natural science, whereas oikos nomos uh, tries to build normative laws and rules for the household management in order to achieve a specific goal, which is the well-being of all household members, or in other terms, the common good. And Aristotle said, um, wealth, material wealth and financial means, um, they are just asset means in a true economy. Whereas if we strive for material wealth um, or financial means as a, as a goal, this would not be economy, this would be uh, crematistique. These are crematists. And uh, I would add to those economists who, who focus on wealth, I would add that the most important wealth that we have on this planet is the genetic and biological uh, diversity. This is our fundamental wealth. <laughs> and the wealth concept of uh, economists should include uh, biodiversity, stable ecosystems, uh, stable global climate uh, as a fundament of all economic thinking. I made once the comment um, in the first degrowth uh, conference in the Euro European Parliament that the most widely used uh, economic models, uh, they forgot to include banks 
in the models before the 2008 financial crisis. And that was widely criticized and is now broadly acknowledged that they forgot to include banks. <laughs> My criticism was different. Uh, you also forgot to include biodiversity. <laughs> it will not uh, um, be a solution for our bigger picture if we include banks, but not biodiversity, because we will be growing in financial terms, but we will uh, um, get, uh, still uh, be getting poorer in our most fundamental wealth, which is uh, genetic and biological diversity. This is why in a holistic economy, the so-called planetary boundaries, which um, aim at the stability of ecosystems from stable climate to stable biodiversity to um, um, the renouncement of chemicals and others. This would be the boundaries and the beginning of uh, economic freedom. And uh, they would be included in a new um, overarching set of goals for the economy, uh, which would replace the GDP. Um, we, we like to call it a common good product. And a common good product may be different from the um, sustainable development goals, those 17 goals. A common good product would be democratically composed by the citizens. We are quite sure that the citizens would both include climate stability and stability of biodiversity as two of maybe 20 sub goals of a common good product. And the common good economy um, is actually nothing else but the original meaning of economy in, uh, in ancient Greek. It's just an economy. It's an economy is by definition a common good economy. And this is why um, the, the purpose or goal of uh, businesses or companies is to increase the common good. And how is the common good defined? Well, in the democratically composed common good product, which does not only include uh, ecological sub goals, but of course also social sub goals from social cohesion to just distribution, uh, democratic participation, gender equality, and others. Um, not everything, but the 20 most important sub goals um, of, uh, of democratic societies. Companies in the common good balance sheet then measure um, same as in the financial balance sheet, they measure their financial success. In the common good balance sheet, they measure how much they contribute to the common good. If companies increase biodiversity, if they increase soil fertility, if they increase the quality of the water they use, they get positive common good points. If they deteriorate these ecological factors or other uh, social sub goals, they get a poorer result in their common good balance sheet. And now comes uh, the better its uh, result, the more positive incentives they meet. They pay uh, lower taxes. They, ga they get priority in public procurement. Uh, they get priority um, uh, with banks and stock markets uh, for, for financial means. Or they trade m freer than companies with a poor or even a negative common good uh, balance sheet result. I need one hand for my phone, but today the, the more ethical companies, the, the more responsible companies, they have higher costs and have a competitive disadvantage uh, re in relation to the dumpers in all disciplines. This is a perverted incentive situation on markets and we would um, correct it uh, until the most sustainable, climate-friendly, responsible and ethical products and services offered to markets are um, more achievable, means um, cheaper than the dumping product. This would be the most important effect of the common good balance sheet for companies. The third level would be investments. Today for every financial investment, uh, a so-called risk assessment uh, is made before the, the finance flows. But the risk assessment, uh, which by the way is obligatory by law, is only made for the financial risk. <laughs> so it's just a grammatistical uh, assessment, but there is no economic assessment in the meaning of human rights and labor rights and gender equality and climate stability and biodiversity. And this is the common good assessment that we propose before the financial risk assessment, because only if a projected uh, investment and the according project does not harm 
any ecological or social or democratic common good. Only then the financial risk assessment is done as a secondary assessment. And if both are passed, um, if both approve, the money flows, no matter if from banks or stock markets or capital markets. And the conditions by law have to be the more favorable, the higher the contribution of that investment to our common goods, which are defined democratically by the uh, citizens in the common good product. And maybe, um, of course, then we have many other proposals, um, but we focus on the uh, last one in order not to be too long, uh, which I call ecological human rights. This now is the responsibility of every individual, an individual person. Um, the thought again starts from the planetary boundaries and the enormous gift of biological resources and ecosystem services of Mother Earth, uh, which every year gives a huge amount uh, to, to humanity, more than we need to meet our basic needs of 8 billion humans. So ecological human rights would give the 8 billionth part of this huge yearly gift as a yearly consumption right. And uh, this means even if all, all 8 billion humans consume their yearly consumption right, stability thresholds the, within the planetary uh, uh, boundaries. We could um, declare these human rights in form of ecological accounts. So equ um, equ um, in the same way you use your um, financial bank account, you would get an ecological bank account in a physical currency, of course, it's not a monetary currency, it's CO2 uh, emission equivalents or global hectares from the global footprint initiative or just jewel there are several um, options uh, at choice but the same um, if your uh, ecological purchase power is used off you cannot buy anything anymore same with the financial <laughs> and um, i i consider a two-tier concept which is based on a uh, kate rayworth donut concept which by the way is based on the planetary boundary concept from the stockholm resilience center uh, if the good message uh, holds true that Mother Earth gives us a little bit more than every person needs to cover the basic needs uh, and we would still remain within the planetary boundaries, then we could give as a non-tradable, unconditional and unalienable right um, what every person needs to cover the basic needs. But the surplus, which is a little bit more, uh, this could be sold by the world's poorest who don't have the financial purchase power anyway to uh, buy things for this surplus to the richest. The richest uh, would have, they have an excess in financial purchase power, but they are comparatively poor in ecological purchase power because these are equal rights for all humans. And uh, the richer could have a softer landing because they could consume a little bit more and the poor could catch up a little bit in terms of living quality and maybe even standard uh, to the richer. So, so it would be a social ecological win-win uh, uh, solution on the planet. Maybe so much it's just uh, some aspect of the whole mosaic of an economy for the common good, but I think it's enough for a first round. Yeah, I, uh, it sounds pretty wholesome, like uh, you're covering everything like not just like ecological destruction and restoration you're also talking about social uh, social issues so um it sounds really good but um uh do you think that uh governments and uh healthcare organizations and everyone in general like or everyone in power uh can use this pandemic as an opportunity to make these drastic uh, changes that we need in our system to um, incorporate more uh, sustainable economic mm. models like uh, the common good? Well, you, you can use it in, in diverse forms. <laughs> Kate already said there is a broad range of possibilities how you could link climate change to the coronavirus um, insights. Same here, maybe give two or maximum three. Um, 
One, uh, one is that we see that it's possible uh, that citizens consume less biological resources. It's possible not to fly and we don't die of that. Um, maybe we don't have, we cannot fulfill all of our wishes, but we can still meet our basic needs. That's the good message. Um, so maybe for a different public good uh, or common good than public health which justifies extreme restrictions and limitations of both fundamental freedoms and consumption options. With only half of that restrictions, we could already stabilize the global climate um, or stabilize biodiversity. If we do not cut off what we need to satisfy our basic needs, but uh, if we cut off with it, which is just excessive consumption from flying on holiday to drive SUVs to eat a lot of meat. If we cut off these um, excessive consumptions, this is neither dangerous to our health nor to our lives. All the contrary, <laughs> scientific studies show uh, that uh, we will be even happier and freer if we focus rather on fulfilling relationships between humans and with nature than on material wealth. This is one um, opportunity that the corona pro, uh, crisis provides and rather an insight and, um, and an option for governments not only to protect public health, but also to protect uh, the global climate or biodiversity. Mm. A second one could be um, that the um, billions which are now pumped into uh, rescue programs, they could um, be linked to conditionalities, but not the conditionalities that we know from the IMF and the World Bank, <laughs> which make the, the poor poorer <laughs> and the rich richer, and the rich countries uh, more powerful and the poor countries um, less powerful, but uh, that we do not rescue the uh, stock market corporation with taxpayers' money, but we rescue first and uh, foremost the, the people, and second, uh, the, the more regional, sustainable, responsible, climate-friendly and regional companies, at least in a higher degree than uh, the, the bigger companies. And we could even link now, it's a huge, it's a um, unique opportunity to link um, a higher degree of rescue engagement to the promise of companies to turn uh, from, from the next year into a common good company, a B corporation, a company with an environmental management system, or a company that obliges to limit inequality to a, a reasonable degree. So if, if every element and aspect of the rescue packages is conditioned to an ecological and social progress, that mm. would be a very different way of facing the crisis than we did in, in the aftermath of 2008 uh, when, the, when the last financial crisis hit us. Mm. Okay. I, I just want to jump in there. Like, um, I know yeah. I just put it in the chat, but um, I noticed that Amsterdam have uh, embraced the idea of this kind of common good, uh, the do Kate Rayworth's donor economic model for after the yeah. COVID crisis so at least some you know cities have been starting to think about some governance some government governments have been starting to think about how to operationalize it mm. so do you think it's going to take off do you, you know it's, it's hard to say at the moment whether governments will take us up mm. i think so um we see that uh, refreshing uh, thinking on economic theory as especially Kate Raworth is doing and others from Tim Jackson to Kate Raworth and to, to, to others. Um, economic science is uh, very slowly, but still opening up. <laughs> There's a worldwide movement of students for more pluralism in economic um, teaching, education and, and science. And especially cities and municipalities open up to new models of well-being rather than wealth. One um, are the proposals of uh, Kate Rayworth, which are very much in line with the economy for the common good. We have so far already dozens of cities, again, Amsterdam in, in a different project, but also Barcelona, uh, Vienna in Austria, or Stuttgart in Germany, diverse cities that do a common good balance sheet uh, for the city, 
which is uh, very similar. They, um, they define these new goals and then they evaluate them and they are audited externally and then they can adjust their political decisions uh, in order to uh, progress in the achievement of these goals. Then we have uh, already 700 uh, companies that have already done a common goal balance sheet and more and more cities uh, promote these companies that are doing this uh, balance sheet. And the better the results, that's, that's very important because you, you talked about true costs. No? Yeah. I think this is a, a key thought, but I, I see two um, options as for the methodological approach. Uh, monetarization, um, or let's say, we're talking about externalities. <laughs> yeah. And we're only talking about externalities in classical economics because classical or neoclassical economists do not consider biodiversity no. and public health and all, climate change. All women at home taking care of kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a key resource. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have to now to, to clean up these externalities <laughs> because they were not considered from the beginning. In a holistic economic approach, they would be considered from the beginning. Uh, now, as we have to clean up these externalities and internalize them, there are two options to get those true values and true costs and true prices. One is um, via monetarization. That's monetary internalization. Uh, this has the disadvantage that we have to give a kind of monetary price or value to every human life, to the extinction of every species, to every damage to, to health. Uh, possible, but tricky. And the second one is which we have chosen so far um, is to um, internalize, internalize indirectly, which means to describe, make transparent, publish, and then evaluate all these externalities um, with common good points. Can be negative ones, can be positive ones. And then according uh, to the result, the quantitative result of a common good balance sheet, these companies, as already stated before, pay, for instance, higher taxes or lower taxes. I give one concrete example that already exists because that was your question also. Um, Portland in Oregon uh, taxes companies in which inequality excesses uh, 100 times between the highest and the lowest incomes in this company with an additional um, profit tax of 10%. And if income inequality increase, um, excesses 250 times, it's plus 25 uh, profit tax. This is a, a small example, but a great and instructive example how we could uh, correct this perverted uh, incentive mechanism on markets that the dumpers have an advantage and turn it yeah, yeah. into a disadvantage. Wow, oh, okay, sounds really uh interesting and uh i i, I really see kate, hope i think kate i see kate is a in in her heart she's a true economist i can <laughs> see <it. laughs> oh, i am now that you've explained the term i don't know so i am actually <laughs> mm -hmm. okay uh, so this is uh really cool and uh because of its wholesome approach i really hope like um organizations and uh, governments uh, accept this and implement this soon like this is a good time to do it uh, okay so uh, I'm just with, since we're running out of time I see I'm just gonna before we jump into q and I'm just gonna uh, frame a question for both of you which is um, if you could create uh, your own future society uh, what kind of future society do you envision um, and what are the three, to narrow this down, what are the three elements that uh, you would absolutely have in this future society? Just to uh, paint us a picture. I think Christian sounded fine. I'd go with that, <laughs> I'd vote for that. Um, I think having um, uh, you know, these planetary boundaries and some social underlying con minimum contract for each human being uh, is, a, is a great idea, you know, I think that that's what we need to do. If, if we're going to meet the sustainable development goals, then we need some minimums and then we need some maximum limits for those planetary boundaries. I think I would kind of slightly be concerned about those planetary boundaries only because we don't have much idea about where those limits are. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we don't understand what those limits are at the moment. 
and we need more work to do that and so I'd be afraid of pushing the edges because you know the boundaries might you know the the error might be quite large but yeah I, I I'm a big fan of Kate Rayworth so I'll just sign up to that <laughs> okay and uh and what about you Christian well just three, um, three elements like, yeah I know you said, discussed a lot of a uh, lot of points so uh sure. just three uh, elements and then we can move into uh, Q&A uh, yeah it's easy because we already agreed on at least one <laughs> yeah <laughs> which, uh, I, which are these um, ecological human rights on the front side of the medal and nature's actually these are nature's rights on the back side of the medal it's, uh, yeah. it's a double yeah. um, then uh, the minimum includes um, let's say a minimum wage or a unconditional basic income which we summarize by negative feedback mechanisms, which means the poorer you are, the easier we make your life and the richer you are, the more difficult it becomes, it gets to become even richer. These are instead of positive feedback mechanisms, which cause exponential yeah. growth, negative feedback mechanisms, which cause stability or equity true equilibrium, equilibrium. We, don't, we do not only need true costs and true prices but also true equilibrium tell it the economist and um, maybe a third one apart from the common goal balance sheet to um, to to help companies to uh, to contribute to these goals would be um, what i call um, sovereign democracy uh, sovereign democracy in the it's a, a new way of, of um, proposing a direct and participatory democracy in uh, creating processes, um, let's say citizen assemblies or conventions, in which citizens can take fundamental decisions on economic policy, monetary and financial system, but also the international trade regime directly, not depending on the, on the, on the decisions of their governments and parliaments exclusively. I leave it there because it's uh, another another big thought. But I think if you ask me for my three favorites, uh, I cannot miss out this one in um, in in my preferences. Okay, okay, very uh, interesting uh, conversation. And now I think we can move into the Q and A. Uh, we are opening up this discussion to questions from our participants. If you have already submitted your question, um, uh, Micah will. Uh, ask it on your behalf. Michael? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so inspiring, uh, such an inspiring talk. Um, so um, yeah, so if you do have questions now that as we go along with the Q&A, once more you can send them to Sorab um, uh, and uh, so we will group them. Um, so one question came up which was from Alejandra Recalde and she, for example, she asked about the model you just uh, described, Christian, um, the model of the economy of, for the common good, and also in which way it could, or could, in which way could it possibly be picked up by the United Nations, or is this something, it does something visionary like this actually make it into these realms? Um, what would actually be needed to accomplish this so so it moves up moves forward uh, to this kind of international level hmm. well the i re i limit myself to two or three again <laughs> <laughs> but the most obvious the most obvious uh, would be that after having um, a convention on um, on civil rights and another one on social cultural or let's say one on political rights, another one on social, cultural and economic rights, a third convention on ecological human rights would be best placed within the United Nations. And just to remember which minimum um, number of countries to start such a, a human rights convention is needed. Um, the, the first two human rights conventions started with 35 signatures only. So uh, it's not necessary that every single country agrees from the beginning, uh, a beginner's group of maybe 50 countries uh, w w would be enough and they could invite more and more countries to join. Another great example is the World Trade Organization, which I fiercely oppose <laughs> because they are not linked to human rights, labor rights, uh, climate protection and biodiversity. They started with only 67 um, signatory countries that's the quite that's not even that's uh, not even half of all countries and they still succeeded 
um, it's it's a bad example because if citizen could citizens of any country could choose between a trade system uh, means game rules for the global trade uh, which are made within the United Nations and in relation to human rights and labor rights and uh, cultural diversity and biodiversity or game rules that are outside the United Nations, as the case of the World Trade Organization is, uh, and not linked to all these other international agreements, I could not imagine a single country in which the majority of the citizens would opt for uh, trade rules outside the United Nations and not linked to the existing international law. So it was just a power play of governments yeah. who uh, were listening to the vested interests of um, um, big business that decided to create this so-called uh, free trade organization. Um, with this uh, sh short excursion, I already allude that um, the United Nations uh, would need to be democratized because otherwise <laughs> I have little hope that they quickly would implement uh, uh, only one of these ideas. A second example is that what we call a common good balance sheet for companies that was already proposed within the United Nations uh, first time in the 1970s. Uh, the United Nations Center on Transnational Corporations was installed on the initiative of some governments. And it was eliminated again a few years later because um, some governments, especially from the rich countries, were opposing any initiative which could uh, shrink the power of transnational corporations. So we need to increase the power of the citizens within the United Nations, and then we will very uh, quickly have uh, ecological human rights, a common good, a, a compulsory common good balance sheet, at least for the, for the, for the major companies. And the third one, which I, I just touched um, uh, shallowly now, is instead of free trade, which is actually enforced trade, it's, we call it free trade, but it's a, it's a compulsion to trade. Countries cannot choose how open they want to be or how much they want to protect themselves. And an ethical trade system, which I propose in a different book, uh, would be made within the United Nations, would uh, not consider trade as an end in and of itself, with the effect or with the uh, meaning the more trade the better, which is not the case because trade can have uh, uh, extremely damaging effects from the global climate to human rights. So um, trade would just be a means. It's nothing bad either, but it's just a means to serve all these nobler goals which we have been talking about from the protection of biodiversity to the protection of human rights. And this would be a third element of the economy for the common good, which could uh, be taken over by the UNCTAD. UNCTAD actually was established to be the regulatory body for the rules of the game for global trade. Um, um, but it, well, the positive uh, news is that it was uh, established at all. It exists since 1964, but it never got the regulatory power because uh, there were fierce opposition from the governments of the European Union, the United States, Canada, Japan, and, uh, and other um, so-called, let's say, let's call them richer countries. If the people um, could reconsider this decision, <laughs> they would uh, not only allow the UNCTAD to continue to exist, but they would hand over the regulatory power for the global trade rules from the World Trade Organization into the uh, United States, uh, as, as, as argued before. This would be the third uh, element which I would propose first um, to be um, adopted by the United Nations. Thank you so much. Um, as we're already on this visionary path and uh, we're already running like kind of a little bit late in time, I would, uh, I would like to continue with one of the questions um, I also had. Um, do you have, because this is the micro, the micro level, do you have, um, have you experienced on you personally on, on a level uh, the organizations you work with um, in your work, um, any people you guide or consult, um, organizations or individuals where there has been a transformation from the regular growth, profit growth approach to the model you're describing? Have you made any positive experiences you could share with us? Sometimes there's these, like these 
paradigm shift yeah. with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Projects yeah. or organizations that yeah. are doing this, like. Of course, I have plenty. I, I, I give two, and I would like to finish with a question back to Kate, if that's still possible in time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. One example is that um, um, companies help um, their um, employees, but also their clients, to consume less meat, for instance, which is relevant in Europe. There is one hotel. They made the first step, and the Comago balance sheet is a very uh, fine-tuned instrument. It allows you to make thousand tiny steps, but feasible steps. One hotel decided to, to start with one day in the week without meat. The consequence was that the cook quit it. But they said, uh, okay, if you're not even ready to cook one day without meat, uh, it's better you quit. Um, the better example is that uh, public health insurer, which has uh, tens of thousands of uh, um, clients or insured persons, they convince them to consume less meat because it's good for the personal health, it's better for the cost structure of the health insurer, and uh, first and foremost, it's good for the global climate. And that's why they got the Global Climate Award at the COP20 for I think it was in, in Katowice. And the second example is um, is a organic soybean producer in Europe, which instead of importing soybeans, uh, which are cultivated in Latin America um, um, after deforestation, and I think deforestation is one, um, one uh, cause for stress on the habitat of uh, whoever, that leads to my question. They, they do not import anything, uh, no agricultural goods at all. They, they cultivate organic soybeans in small scale organic farming within Europe. And I think this is a, a, a alternative that shows that we do not need that degree of global trade and especially um, commodities and agricultural goods should be uh, produced locally. Um, and my question to Kate is, I understood I understood so far um, and ask you if, what's your opinion about it. Um, if for instance, through deforestation, the, the, the pressure on the habitat of uh, bats or other um, zoonotic animals increases, uh, they, they become more contagious. Uh, whereas if they have less stress, they're less contagious and more stress, more con contagious. Could you maybe say some, some words more about this um, question uh, of myself. I guess it's a, it, there's an immune question there that I think you're asking, which is, is kind of separate to a pathway question. So maybe mm. I'll go with the pathway question first. If you're deforesting a habitat, you are, I'll give an example from a disease that I know. So you, you're kind of removing the areas which uh, the bats need, for example, and this has happened in in Australia. So they removed the forests and they converted those forests, and then bats don't have anything to eat, so they forage further, and they're a bit more immune compromised because they're stressed because they don't have enough food, and so they enter some of these cities in Australia because they're looking for food, and so they'll be hanging out in the urban areas because that's the only food tree, fruiting tree. That there is around and so that your risk of, of a pathway there is higher because you're in more in contact with those you know the fruit fruit that's dropped that might be affected or just poo that's you know from the from the tree so that they're roosting in for example so mm. uh, like if you if you could think about how and that's an example of of uh, of hendra and nipah viruses that's that's had an outbreak in australia so if you could change that dynamic, so you leave areas that are intact with fruiting trees, then the bats don't need to come into cities to feed, and so that your your pathways are reduced. So, like if you have stressed animals, definitely when we're stressed, we get colds and stuff like that. So, when when we're stressed or uh, you're more vulnerable, you definitely shed more pathogens because that's just the way that we're built. So yes, more stressed animals will give you uh, a higher risk, but the, the biggest reason is kind of disrupting their natural systems and then the pathways change. So it's not like you deforest an area and then you can predict 
what the the outcomes for disease are going to be it's a bit more complicated because there are lots of steps in between so it's it's um <laughs> it's it's difficult to answer your question directly okay. but you know that's certainly true for another example would be nauseae malaria so nauseae so there's lots of different types of malaria if you didn't know mm. and nauseae malaria is actually from from monkeys to humans and most mm -hmm. malaria is human to human via mosquitoes but this one is monkeys to humans and it's it's really prevalent where you have um uh people moving into the forest and converting the land into agricultural uh agricultural land and production and you've got humans in that interface where they weren't before and then the mosquitoes and then the monkeys and monkeys mosquitoes and human malaria goes massively up so you've had a, a massive exponential rise in nausea and malaria in malaysia so that's because you you've got this risky interface between animals mosquitoes and humans what that we've caused so around the settlements of those kind of areas where monkeys are mosquitoes are and humans so you know and there, but there are other examples that don't work that way so it's um it's kind of we need a more nuanced approach to understanding risk that's context dependent and we can factor in global change in terms of how many humans there are and climate change and land use change thank you you need ecologists Good. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I'd love to study more about that. That's really interesting. The systemic knowledge, uh, I think only the systemic knowledge can lead into wisdom and that's what's needed. Yeah. Thanks. So if we still have time, we could maybe do one more question. There's many questions, but of oh. course it's, time. it's a question of time. Christian and, and Kate, how are you in time? Good, I could do another question yeah. and get dinner after that. Okay. Sure. <laughs> There's oh, always uh, time for one. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> we so, can talk okay. Christian again now, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a question also, yes, for Christian. Um, Nikhil uh, asks, um, how can we counterweight against the ne neoliberal voices who are now monopolizing the post-corona dis discussion with arguments like, let's first save the old economy and put the other objectives like climate, e equality, human rights, etc., cetera, um, on pause? Mm. Yeah, well, um, one with um, uh, strong positive alternative visions, <laughs> The going back to business is is actually no way for us because we would go back to <laughs> destruction. That's what caused it in the first place. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's what caused it in the first place. You know, you can't go back to the old economy. That's what caused this problem in the first place. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It, it as we already said, is highly dis uh, destructive. Um, what we could now uh, take from the um, from the slogans and indicators that were used in the crisis, like flatten the curve by all means. And uh, the, the, the governance line was the replication factor of one. So we have to provide that uh, uh, one infected person uh, does not infect uh, more than one other person. That was in, at least in Austria, the absolute governance line. And we could now um, um, ask to flatten all the other lines, which were going exponentially up before the corona crisis, um, consumption of natural resources, uh, global warming, loss of biodiversity, endangered species, and all this. We, we, we could um, ask to, to flatten all these uh, lines and to um, make the new governance line the 1.5 degree uh, objective the 1.7 the global hectares uh, goal of the global footprint concept, or um, not allowing anybody to earn more than 20 fold of, um, of uh, the, the national minimum income, just for instance. And if these three would become the, uh, the, new, the new guideline and uh, likewise effectively, effectively pursued by the governments, um, this would lead, and now is the third argument, this would lead to a, a higher degree of happiness and freedom. 
because we have scientific proof from all disciplines except economics, but economists are neither natural <laughs> scientists nor experts in happiness. They are just experts in wealth creation because they're actually just crematists and not economists. But true economists who think holistically, they know that um, Flattening all these lines means a true equilibrium in uh, ecological terms, social equilibrium, power relationship equilibrium, gender balance, um, um, balanced trade balances and stable financial markets. They would make people both happier and freer. And uh, yes, we would renounce of, uh, uh, just of the excessive consumption uh, patterns that we uh, have cultivated in the richer countries. But the wins and the gains in life quality, in, uh, in fulfilling relationships, in social cohesion and trust, in political participation and uh, well-being um, and the common good overall uh, would outweigh uh, these uh, comparatively small renouncements um, um, by far. So we would become happier and freer and we would, and, and my suggestion is to to emphasize this discourse, because that the final arguments uh, of these so-called neoliberals, I, I prefer to call them pseudo-liberals or illiberals, because they take away much more freedom than what they give uh, in form of freedom to the uh, uh, corporations, um, is, is in the end not about more freedom and uh, more happiness. And, uh, and we could just twist this, um, this narrative um, offering um, true liberty or at least a more comprehensive liberty and um, scientifically proven um, a higher degree of happiness um, to, um, um, for people who live in a post-corona common good oriented uh, sustainable equilibrium donut economy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, maybe uh, one more question. <laughs> we have a With lot pleasure. of very interesting. So, so um, With pleasure. now the it, because people to, are totally totally love the topic and like also the visionizing and really moving towards some alternative way of living. Certainly, there are so many people. So, what could be actually the concrete steps? Uh, is this question comes up a lot? Um, kind of, what are the concrete steps? So, either on governmental side communal side, individual side, you already mentioned this also. The donut model, I think it's like known to some people or maybe parts of it. I already shared the link earlier um, and you mentioned Amsterdam. So maybe you can mention like one or two more examples. Um, so it becomes a bit more tangible um, of already existing projects or how could this be implemented on a communal governmental level or on a governmental level on a higher up? Level. Or, mm -hmm. or even on an individual level, like what yeah, the, you know, the UK, is the UK government is is trying to push uh, a number of things, but trying to push the environment bill, which is uh, I really like because it's taking an integrated land use management view of the country. So it's trying to see how you manage land for common good. So it's kind of like you know public money for public goods. And so, you know, an example could be like if you're uh, if you're uh, if you're farming on upland Welsh mountains, you are causing flooding down. You may be causing flooding downstream because you're stripping the land and you're overgrazing on those things. And so, you know, we need to have a discussion about how best to use that land. I'm not saying turf the Welsh farmers off as you have a revolution, but could they be using? Could that? that livelihood be replaced by something else. And I guess I mention it because it's a way to think about integrated land management, which is a kind of spatial view of the world, a place-making view of the world. So can we think, and somehow it's easier for people to grasp, you know, so our, my garden, for example, can I plant more trees in it? You know, what, what could we be the, the best use of that land? What public money for public good? And I think that's, to me, that was really, that made me feel really help, hopeful because that was a, um, a really big step for us to have an integrated land management plan, which, which touches everybody in the country. So Christian might think that's stupid, but, <laughs> but you know, that to me, that was really fundamental. I, that was about a sense of place. And that, that could be, 
that could be at the university level or the company level like well okay we've got this surrounding uh, areas we're not going to put a car park on because that's going to increase our flood risk but actually we're going to put trees on and that will you know increase our carbon you know credits or whatever it is so i think that that kind of land-based place-based decision making is really important mm -hmm. for for, pe for people's decisions i i think it's a great idea and it's um in in my interpretation about democracy it's about sovereign democracy <laughs> sovereign democracy um is in this case latin uh, because so sovereignty is a, it's a democratic principle but it means to stand above all and if we ask who is the sovereign um, instance in a democracy it's the people and if the people truly stood above all other democratic um, levels and instances and bodies they could define everything virtually um, not only the, the the land use patterns or the landscape shape in their hometown this should be the beginning this should be the minimum standard that people can ask to be involved and have the final word on um, how how the landscape of their hometown and city is uh, configured. That's uh, our minimum um, understanding of democracy. The highest would be that they participate in democratic conventions on reshaping uh, the global trade regime or um, uh, defining the, the 20 components of the of the common good product, which replaces the GDP. But let me start a little bit slower and end there again, <laughs> which is, I think, the, the, the most practical tool that um, our movement offers um, to every body and every government and um, every organization is the common good balance sheet. Um, uh, political um, bodies can use it to link it to all of their incentives. There are dozens of incentives from land use management is it's a political decision and they can link uh, land use management for instance to to the most sustainable organization instead of to the highest bidder just uh, just one example we have this the balance sheet as a self test for individuals and um, i think many commenters have said that at least some of us uh, can um, take this involuntary retreat as uh, an exercise to uh, reflect on our basic needs and reflect on what we really need and um, um, the outcome should not be a, a consumption style and a lifestyle um, lower in material goods in the rich countries at all and um, a lifestyle uh, richer in fundamental values such as contributing to human dignity to ecological sustainability solidarity justice and democracy these are by the way the five fundamental values that that we identified um, in the economy for the common good movement as as the most widespread uh, constitutional values in democracies and um, as a consequence of um, the, the deep reflection of these fundamental values and how you as a person can every day contribute to the deeper fulfillment of these values one consequence could be that you support the idea of ecological human rights one consequence one other consequence could be that you join civil society movements which strive for the protection of biodiversity which strive for nature's rights which strive for an unconditional basic income which strive for money as a public good and not so much as a private good or for an economy uh, for the common good and uh, last but not least, my personal uh, deepest insight is no matter which uh, political topic we look at, at the end, it's a question of who takes the final decision on these topics, problems uh, and global challenges. And in the current uh, economic system, the uh, power is so much concentrated in, uh, in branches, corporations, and business sectors that it's um, almost impossible to advance in any of these <laughs> sectors. And this is why my, my final insight is that if we the people do not recognize that we are the sovereign instance in, the, in at least in functioning democracies, and we should strive for the final word, word 
in, in all these policies, economic policy, monetary and financial policy, gender policy and environmental policy, uh, then um, we will um, observe uh, very little and slow progress. And that, that's what I have empirically seen. People would support um, a much more ambitious measures to protect our common goods from biodiversity to a, a more just distribution than governments and parliaments do. And this is why uh, this is my final recommendation. Think over deeper over democracy. Who uh, should take the, the final decisions? How about starting a democratic convention? That's the way we call it in your, in your city, in your town. And this could be your personal uh, contribution uh, to global change. Thank you so much. It's very, very inspiring, Christian. Um, at this point, I would also like to share again real quick the uh, details um, uh, for the donations we raised today, also for your foundation, because it's a very, it's a visionary model and uh, people are fond of it. So, of course, we want to also totally support it. Um, I shared it now with uh, all participants in the discussion. I hope people can see it. Um, it's the bank details and also the website. Um, so there was one little question. I just don't, I didn't, I don't want to follow the entire question, but just a word, just a name, the happiness studies. Can you say a name? Because someone asked for it earlier. Is there any name you can drop here on happiness studies? Well, um, there are uh, many we sources. To. Sorry? We don't have to. It's just that I... I no. that was a, yeah. I would like that the first two that occur, there are, um, there are many indicators on the happiness indexes. They, in the rich countries, they go down, <laughs> whereas GDP keeps growing. This is one um, that, that the sources are, well, in, in the books at least, but Maybe the, 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 the more relevant one is from the social um, psychologist, Tim Kasser. He and his colleagues and his co-researchers, uh, they found out that uh, living um, capitalistic values, which are not economic values, which are crematistic slash capitalistic values, which are opposed to true economic values, which all belong actually to the common good. If people choose or are um, captured in structures that uh, give priority to capitalistic materialistic values, they are less happier and and less uh, less free. It's Tim Kasser, mm -hmm. social psychologist, and and his and his colleagues. Great, thank okay. you so much. Um, I just found. A, I'm just putting a link here. It's a random link, but it's him. Um, so um, thank you so much no. for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Very inspirational. It's also nice to look things up afterwards. <laughs> welcome yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay um, so I think with that uh, we should uh, close our event I'd like to once again thank Kate and Christian for taking time out from their really busy schedules and joining us today uh, I think we all learned some very interesting facts about zoonosis how it is interlinked to biodiversity laws and we learned a lot about the common good economy as well if this crisis has taught us anything, it is that we are capable of making drastic changes and adapt and do that really fast. So I hope uh, that we all have some takeaways and some action points on what we're gonna improve and what we're gonna change. And um, thank you so much everyone for attending our event. Uh, have a great evening uh, <laughs> and a nice guys. weekend. Thanks, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye.